Our title of the sermon today is called Obedience of Christ. We're actually starting in a new sermon series today. Uh, we've been in Jonah for the past eight weeks. Um, it's kind of exciting to get into some new territory. But our passage today is going to come from Matthew chapter 26, 36 to 46. Matthew chapter 26, 36 to 46. I'll read this for us. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but this flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went and prayed away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And then he came to his disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let us pray. Dear God, I just pray that you may open up our ears. May you open up our hearts to receive your words, O Lord, and may it speak to us. May it challenge us, O Lord, and may we be able to see your awesome glory, O Lord, and love for us. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you. May your gospel be preached, O Lord, and may your Holy Spirit work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, for the next six weeks, um, we're going to be focusing on um, this series called The Road to the Cross. Uh, traditionally, Christians all over the world are spending right now in a time of Lent. Um, if you guys don't know what a time of Lent is, it's basically 40 days before Easter um, where people begin to fast and begin to just reflect on what Christ has done. Um, Lent actually began um, back in, in March 1st on, on Ash Wednesday. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed the, the crosses on people's foreheads of ash. That's not because they were cleaning out their, their fireplace and touched their face by accident. It's because, you know, it's a sign of submission and humility before God. Although um, our church doesn't tightly follow the tradition of Lent as some other churches do, I think it's extremely important to continually prepare our hearts as we um, just reflect on Passion Week coming, on, on Jesus' life, death, and also resurrection. And our series today, it's going to start um, before the day that Jesus dies on the cross. This is actually the day that he's arrested. And we're just going to go through a series of different sermons that walks us all the way up to Easter. So next week, um, today we're going to talk, actually today we're going to talk about the obedience of Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Next week, we're going to talk about the arrest of Jesus. The week after that, the trial of Jesus in front of Pilate. And then we're going to talk about the death of Jesus. And then finally on Easter, we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And then after that, a follow-up sermon called The Followers of Jesus. So um, stay tuned for each of this. We're going to walk towards the cross, the road to the cross. You know, in all honesty, this sermon title is actually very offensive in a literal sense. I mean, the road to the cross. If you really, really think about its implications, it's actually saying the road to the electric chair or the road to lethal injection or the road to being shot by a firing squad. I mean, this is a, a Roman capital punishment that, that Christians are rallying behind, but it's ironic that our entire faith is, is centered on such a dark symbol. You know, for us as Christians, when we look at the cross, we're like, oh, it's beautiful. You know, Christ died for us. Look at the grace. Look at the love. But 2,000 years ago, the word cross was actually like a curse word to people. I mean, it was a condemning word. It represented everything wrong in the world. It represented shame. It represented weakness, destruction. It represented guilt, humiliation, loss, and failure. It was a word that nobody wanted their life associated with. Yet Christians all around the world, we rally behind the symbol. I mean, when we come up with symbols or logos for a company, I mean, if, if you're starting something new and you want people to join, what are you going to think of? Like, you're going to probably think of some pretty symbols, you know? Uh, but imagine this. I mean, 
you know, I, I was, I was, as I was, I was writing the sermon, I was like, yo, death row records, man, they're just like Christians, you know, they got the, 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 for those of you guys that love 90s hip hop, you guys know what I'm talking about, but I mean, imagine, imagine if we made t-shirts with an electric chair and walked around with it. I mean, this is basically what Christianity is representing right now, a cross. But this is one of the reasons why I know that Christianity is a real deal. I mean, it's raw. It doesn't you try to give you some kind of beautiful picture saying, follow us, it's all fluffy and good. No, it shows us the cross. When talking about creating a movement or a religion for that matter, you want to paint something else, not a cross. I mean, you give them symbols like white Lexuses, join our movement, you're going to get this. You know, I remember walking into uh, my wife's aunt's house, Yung Young's house, and, they, and, and her, her, her family had like a poster of different pictures, you know, they had... Um, they had like a house with a pool. They had like an expensive car, expensive jewelry, awesome vacation spots. And I'm just like looking at this. I'm like, yo, they're adults. And what is this poster doing in here? And she was explaining to me. She was like, yeah, the company that she works with says, make this poster, put it on your wall, and that's your goal. And work hard, you know. And I was like, huh, that's kind of cool. And I was like thinking about it. But then, you know, Christianity, we got this cross. We're like, yo, come and die. Like join our movement. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, 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 it's kind of weird. But it made me wonder, I mean, what happened to change the meaning of the cross? I hope that throughout this entire sermon series, we're able to grapple with the meaning, what the, what the deeper meaning of this cross is, and understand why we rally behind it, why we preach it, and what makes the gospel so special that this death symbol, this curse word, has become our greatest hope and joy in life. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Today, we start in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, after 33 years of Jesus living on earth, 33 years and three years of doing ministry, I mean, Jesus goes around, he heals people, he preaches God's word, he makes the blind see, he feeds the hungry, he's doing all these good things, and now he's finally in the garden praying to God because he knows that his time has come to die. He's about to face the cross. This story happens the night that Jesus is arrested, the day before he's crucified. And we're going to witness the awesome obedience of Jesus Christ to God the Father in this garden. There's a few things that we're going to be learning today, and they all kind of connect where they better connect. One is Jesus' humanity. Sometimes we forget that Jesus actually was a human. This is really important to understand. Two is Jesus' obedience despite his humanity. And three, we're going to learn our response, what we're actually called to do with that. But first, Jesus was a human like us. You know, when I was reading today's passage, I had a flood of questions to come, came, come, come upon me. You know, as a person who his whole life tried to be a tough guy, you know, I, I, I never smiled in pictures in high school. I don't know why. You know, I strive to be a tough guy my entire life, try to be a courageous leader, you know, like a pastor that people want to follow and listen. In all honesty, if I was Jesus, I don't think I would ever want this scene of my life to ever be made public. I mean, it's so raw, full of no emotions. I don't like showing emotions. It's not even just like the, the crying and sad type of emotions. I don't even like to show that I'm angry because it shows that something got to me. You know, I don't like emotions in general. But here we see Jesus very emotional. I mean, check out the passage. It says this, verse 36 to 38. Then Jesus went to, a, went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And, taking, and ta taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Notice Jesus is so overwhelmed at this moment. He was like, yo, please just stand and by, be by my side. I mean, have you ever been at a point where you're so hurt that you don't want any suggestions? You don't want even people to talk to you. You just want them there, like sitting there. Just sit here and watch and pray with me. That's it. Jesus is at a point where he's so overwhelmed emotionally. I mean, he's sitting there. I can probably imagine tears maybe coming out of his eyes. We know that he's sweating at this point. He's so emotionally filled that he says just, and he pleads with them three times, please stay with me, stay awake with me. But this aspect of Jesus is very new to me. I don't know if it's new to you, but it was new to me. Because my entire life, I like to view Jesus as like this hero figure where he looks at death and he just runs to it like, yo, I got this, you know. But suddenly I see Jesus. He's, he, he's like scared of it. He's sitting there. He's praying over it. I'm like, what's going on? I have a mental image of what a hero is supposed to be, and this was not it. 
You know, there's a time in my life after my father passed when I was young uh, where my mother sent my sisters and I to Korea because she couldn't um, handle raising us three by herself. Uh, we stayed there for a little over, a little under a year. And they said that every night I would cry saying that I miss my mom. Very, very sad point in my life, I guess. <laughs> but I, I would cry every night. And even to the point where I had, I used to have a dot under my eye, um, and my aunt said, get rid of it, because that means you're going to cry a lot. Like, this, I guess that's how much I cried. Um, but I remember my uncle, whom I respected a lot, he says, why are you crying? Men don't cry. You know, dry up those tears. He actually said this, men only cry twice in life. One, when they're born because they can't help it, and they're trying to talk. And two, when your mom dies. That's it. You don't cry any other time. And he looked at me straight in my eyes, and he said this. You have to be a leader of your family one day, man up and dry up your tears. And he permanently stamped something in my mind about what it meant to be a leader and, and, a, and a man. I think this is the reason why, like, uh, the fathers of our older generations, they're like stoic people, not because they don't have emotions, but because they're just told to suppress it. But I think it's the same in the Middle Eastern times. Jesus acting like this is totally uncalled for. In fact, in the Middle Eastern times, they said that guys, or in the biblical times, guys didn't even run because that would show weakness, you know, because it would look stupid. They would lift up their robe and run. They're like, no, guys don't run. They didn't climb. They didn't do anything. I doubted they cried either because they had expectations. And I'm like looking at this, and I'm like staring at this, yet we see Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, emotional, crying out, burdened and beaten down. He really was a man. He really was a man. The person we worship, yes, is God, but at the same time, he really was a man. And this is so crazy to the worldview back then. Christianity is still rejected by a lot of other faiths because we talk about God becoming a man. You know, I was watching a movie called The Interview. I know it's a stupid movie, but it's the, anyways, it just fits so perfectly with what I was thinking about. But this, this movie didn't air on, um, on, I think, in the movie theaters because of, like, political reasons. But it's basically about, like, a producer and a, a reporter that goes to North Korea to interview the North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-un. And in the process, they're like in North Korea, and they realize that all the beautiful buildings and stuff were all fake. And they're like, yo, it's an eggshell of a country. Like, what happened here? Like, we thought it was beautiful. We thought this guy was so cool. What is going on? And they end up teaming up with some other leaders in the country saying, yo, we have to expose this guy. Everybody here believes that he's a god, but he's just human. We have to show everybody. So, you know, the whole movie is about, like, getting him on live television and making him cry, making him bleed. I think they eventually kill him on TV, and then, you know, the, the whole country is free. But you know what's crazy? This is one of the mysteries of the gospel. The world wants a superhero that can conquer everything. The world wants miracles. The world wants power. The world wants a God beyond humanity. The world wants a strong hero. But the Christian faith says this, you get a man who poops, pees, cries, eats, sweats, bleeds, and even dies. And this is your God. You know, this is how I know that the gospel is not a fairy tale. It can't be. Because people are trying to make up the story. You're going to make them look tougher than this. The gospel doesn't do that. It's real. It's raw. It shows something that actually happened. Our text says that Jesus is troubled. This is a word that means like agony over somebody's heart. When the burden of pain come upon, uh, comes upon somebody and it, it's like crushing him, he's troubled. And he says that it hurts him to the point of death. Jesus is at a point where he says, I'd rather die than feel this pain in my heart. And it doesn't say this in our passage in Matthew, but in Luke, it describes this moment saying that Jesus was so stressed out that he was sweating blood. We actually know that this is a, a, a real medical condition called hema, hematodrosis, which is when a person is under such great stress that, the, that, that the, the blood vessels behind their pores like erupts and pops. Some of you doctors in this room, I don't know if it's real, but it, it pops and they sweat blood. And all this points to the fact that Jesus, our God, was re a, really a human that bleeds. Sometimes we forget this. I mean, we always talk about Jesus being God. We worship him as the second person of the Trinity. We sing songs to him. But do we know that he actually felt pain? He felt temptation. He felt hunger. He felt the need for companionship. He was happy at times. He was lonely at times. He was mad at times. He felt everything that humans go through. And this is so important to understand. So important to understand if we want to actually respect the way that he was obedient. You know, sometimes we're like, oh, yeah, he's God, though. You know, he's, of course he's obedient. No, he was actually human. He felt it, yet he was obedient. 
The first point, Jesus is just human like us, is a human not just like us, yet Jesus obeys. This is a second point. Let's continue in our text. It says this, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it will be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He prays this three times. Sometimes, you know, we read the word cup and we're not really sure what that means. I mean, does it mean just we're dying? The cup during that time is actually, you know, they used to, um, uh, they used to, they used to ask, execute people by drinking poison. Um, so they would give them a cup and basically, you know, it symbolizes death coming. But I think it's more than just physical death. I mean, have you ever wondered why Jesus at this moment is, so, moment is so emotional? It's not that dying was something new to him. It really wasn't. I mean, he knew his whole life that he was going to die. He actually told and preached it to his disciples over and over again. But what, what made this moment so different? I think we need to understand what this death in the cup actually symbolized. Jesus, throughout his life, had perfect union with God. He walked with God. He had fellowship with God. In fact, from all eternity, we know that God existed as a trinity, forever together in perfect love. But for the first time, the cup meant this, that he was going to get rejected from God. Sin at its core, it's not just breaking rules, it's not. Sin at its core is rejecting God, and it's also facing rejection from God. In other words, it's a lack of relationship, and it's a broken relationship. I mean, isn't it true? You know, I really believe that the worst feeling in the entire world, the worst feeling is being rejected by somebody, that, somebody you love, somebody that should love you, somebody that's walked with you. And Jesus, for the first time, ever felt that separation, and he felt hell come upon his soul. Guys, sin at its ultimate level is hell because it breaks us away from God's presence. You know, I'm not going to act like I know what, what Jesus is feeling. I mean, I don't think anyone can. I've never prayed so hard that I, or stressed out so hard that I was sweating blood. You know, I can try, but it doesn't really work. But for a moment, I felt like I understood those tears. I mean, if it's just physical pain, I mean, we can go through it, right? Like clench our teeth and get your arm chopped off and, you know, just close your eyes and it happens. But I'm talking about that, that, that relational breakage. Everybody who knows who lost a loved one at some point knows that feeling. You know, these days I get so emotional. Um, I think it's after having children. Um, you know, when I used to watch movies about, like, kids getting kidnapped or, or kids dying of cancer or something, I would be like, oh, that's sad, but I wouldn't really care that much. And I just watch it like, hey, I get it. Yo, but now you feel, feel the weight, you know, like. These days when I watch movies and I, and I see kids get sick, like I picture Sophie's face there and I'm like, oh, and, you know, I like look at my wife and I'm like, oh, I can't watch this. You know, my weakness, I can't show it. But it's something real. And I've only known my daughters for like two years, not even. Imagine a relationship that you know that has been known for eternity being broken. This is what Jesus is facing, an eternal break from God or that breakage from God from an eternal relationship. And Jesus, just tasting this in the garden, puts him in a state of shock. Jesus, who was sinless and perfect, was now taking on our sins. And that meant rejection. One scholar put it like this. Jesus came to be with the Father for an interlude before his betrayal. He wanted to be comforted, but found hell rather than heaven open before him. And it staggered him. This is the cup that Jesus is praying over. It's not just physical death. It's a relational break. You know, the Garden of Gethsemane, or Mount Olives, that some people call it, is symbolic of a place where olives were crushed, crushed so that oil would be made um, for the king that would be anointed. I think it's really symbolic because Jesus Christ, our King of Kings, our anointed Messiah, would be crushed, crushed, and taken on, uh, would take on hell for his people so that we may have a relationship with God, our King of Kings. You know, at the end of the day, we're talking about Jesus who felt all these real temptations, felt all these real emotions, coming to the God, praying three times, Lord, if you will let this pass, but not as my will, but as your will be done. You know, it all starts from here. Obedience to the Father in heaven. It starts from here. Obedience to the plan that God has set to save his people. In our passage, we see two things that are happening. One, we see two obediences going on. One is the obedience of his disciples to stay awake, and another is obedience of Jesus to take the cup. Guess what? Jesus triumphs, and his people fail. But, you know, I was, like, looking at this. I'm like, yo, is this a safe comparison? I'm mean, to stay awake compared to taking on hell? 
But this is the craziness of Jesus' obedience. You know, at one point, Jesus goes up to them and says, Watch and pray that you may enter, not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. I think that second line kind of stands out because I think Jesus understood that feeling, that feeling of temptation. He felt it. He felt the flesh was weak, but his spirit was willing. It's crazy because even as Jesus is going through hell for them, he's understanding his disciples falling asleep. Do you see how Jesus understands our weaknesses? He sees our struggles with our sins. He sees us being tempted. He sees us trying to live a better life. He sees us trying to love our enemies. And this is the God we serve, a God that understands. He's not distant. He's there with us, and he feels the pain. Hebrews chapter 4, 14 to 15, it's going to come on the screen. It says this, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Do you guys see what's going on here? He obeys while his disciples fall away. There's a twofold thing that happens as Jesus as human or God as human. One, he takes on the punishment for our sins. And two, he lives a life of obedience that we were called to live. In other words, Jesus dies the death that we should have died while living the life that we should have lived. And there's a parallel here. The Garden of Eden was where Adam fell. But the Garden of Gethsemane is where God would triumph in obedience. In the Garden of Gethsemane is where Adam disobeyed and the whole world fell. But in the Garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus would obey to save the world. Romans 5, 19 says this, For by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. Now you guys are probably thinking, okay, you made a good point. Okay, Jesus is human, was human, or eternally God and human. Okay, he obeyed. What am I supposed to do? So what? And I thought about this for a while. So what? There's two things that we are called to do in response to this. One is faith. The first step is believing. If there's anybody in this room that doesn't believe, this is what faith actually does. Faith connects our life to Jesus' life. For grace, we have been saved through faith. The moment we trust in God and have faith, this is when Jesus' life and obedience becomes ours. His righteousness becomes ours. In exchange, Jesus takes on hell for us. But the second part is this, follow. We're called to live a life of obedience as Jesus was obedient. But this doesn't mean that we're going out there to take on hell for people. This is actually one thing that we can't do for nobody, no matter how much we want to. It doesn't even necessarily mean we're out to go there to sacrifice everything we have. This is not where God is going with. But it's simply living a life of obedience. You know, sometimes people think that the Christian faith is just a call to be sacrificial. Show the world sacrificial love. Go out there and do some good things. But you know what the Garden of Gethsemane tells us? Christian faith is more about obedience than sacrifice. And I'd never thought this before. I mean, if you look at Gethsemane, before Jesus goes out and dies on the cross, before he gets arrested, before he's, he, he's taken on into trial, he has a moment of obedience to the Father. Jesus didn't merely pray for love. He prayed for a heart of obedience. Sacrifice can be a part of obedience, but obedience doesn't necessarily mean sacrifice. And let me show you how. In the book of Samuel, there's a story about a king, Saul who went out there, and after conquering an entire nation, he kept all this money, all the spoils, all the, fl- all the like, animals and everything, and he said, I'm going to give it to you, God. And God looks at all this sacrifice. You know, sacrifice is an act of giving. And he looks at all that and says, this is not what I wanted. I said to destroy it all. And then Samuel goes up to him and says this, does the, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. I think there's something to be learned here. We're called to obedience more than sacrifice. But what does that actually mean? You know, Christians aren't mere do-gooders of this world. We're actually people called for a purpose, to live what God wants us to live for. You know, when the gospel merely becomes sacrifice, you know what happens? We make judgment calls on our own depending on what we think is better while ignoring God. And oftentimes our sacrifice is more for ourselves than actually for God. You know, uh, 
two weeks ago in our growth group, one of our members said one of their biggest pet peeves are watching those guys that, that try to be good, you know, with their face, you know, put on like happy smiles and, and do a lot of good stuff and wanting to receive praise. She's like, I hate that. Oh, I just want to punch him in the face. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right. That's sacrifice without obedience, not knowing the heart of God. You know, I've been learning so much on this lately as a church planner and, and as a pastor. My heart is always racing, you know. I'm always trying to plan for new things, always looking for better ways to do ministry, always studying to write a decent sermon, you know, uh, you know always trying to go out and meet people to see how they're doing. You know, we're, we're, I'm always meeting people. And I never realized how many pastors' meetings there are in the Philadelphia area. Like, everybody's into networking. Like, I'm, I'm sick of seeing those suckers. But anyways, <laughs> meeting after meeting, yo. But I'm the type of guy that if I'm not doing something, I feel like guilty, like I'm sinning or something. So I always look for something to do, even if there's nothing to do. And something that I found pounding on my heart lately is this. Whether it's through mentors speaking into my life or in my prayers, God is saying, Paul, more than sacrifice, more than your work, more than your time, more than your efforts, more than all that, listen to my voice and follow me. And it made so much sense. If you think about it, guys. Because no matter how much sacrifice you do, if it's in the wrong direction, it's meaningless. I mean, for instance, if you walk and run in a certain direction or drive really fast, like 80 miles per hour, no matter how hard you're working, it doesn't matter if it's in the wrong direction. A moment of obedience is listening to God's voice to direct you to the right path. What's the use of sacrificing when it's not what God wants? And I found out the secret of living in obedience, and it all starts with prayer. Jesus begins his ministry by fasting and prayer, and Jesus begins his march towards the cross with this moment of prayer. You know, I think this teaches about something about prayer. It's not just coming to God with our prayer requests, but it's coming to God saying, Lord, use me. Make my will match up to yours and saying God's Jesus' prayer, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. This is coming to God with all of our decisions and asking him for wisdom. And you know what happens when that happens? In the moment of prayer, God gives directions to those who come and ask. And I'm not saying he's speaking to you guys audibly. I mean, he could. But he'll guide you, whether through your meditations, whether through your reading of scripture or your life circumstances, because prayer opens up the ears to listen. Prayer, in essence, is opening up your ears and eyes to receive guidance from God. And this is the heart of prayer. And this is where obedience starts from. David was a man after God's heart. Saul was a guy that just sacrificed. May we not be stubborn in our own ways, and may we open up the doors of of obedience through our prayers. You know, there's a story of an old sailor that repeatedly got lost on sea. I mean, he was a guy that just went out there. He would always get lost, so his friends got kind of annoyed. They're like, yo, here's a compass. Take the compass, man, and and find your way back to dry land. Guy takes the compass. He goes back out on sea. He's missing for a few days. His friends are like, what's going on? Friends go out. After a few days, they look for him. They actually find him, and they look at him. He's like, yo, dude, why didn't you use the compass? And the guy said, hey, you know, I was trying to use it, but, you know, I was trying to go north or make, trying to make it point north, but it kept pointing southwest. So I, I got mad, so I wanted to go my way, so I went my way, and the guys are like, you idiot. Like, what are you doing? Like, no, follow the compass. And I really feel like this is what devotion to God is, is following that compass, Meditating on his word, praying before him. I pray that we may not be like the sailor that is just running the race of life without ever coming before God. You know, my wife and I have begun to pray every night together. And um, I'm not saying this to, 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 I don't know, to brag about anything. But we haven't really been praying after our second child has been born. You know, it's like, it's really busy, you know, and you just kind of go through life and we just realize months are passing by and we haven't been praying. And we're like, all right, finally, we're like, yo, let's do it. So we do it right after our kids go to sleep. We put it away before we wind down, before we watch that television show. We, we sit down and we pray together. And we just started small, you know, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, hour. It doesn't matter, you know. The, the length doesn't matter. I want to encourage you guys in this room, for the couples in this room or just people, to set a time to pray together. But as we're doing this, we started to make a list of different things to pray about. We had the church. We actually have om- almost all of you in this room. If you're, if you're new, I don't have you guys on my list yet. But we pray to you guys by name. Um, pray for different ministries. Pray for things in our life. And as we were praying, um, something crazy started to happen. 
you know, as a pastor, you start getting busy doing random stuff. But as we were praying on certain things, God actually started to direct our, our prayers on what's more important. You know, you ever think about that? When you're just living life, just moving, you miss a lot of things. But when you stop and you step back and God gives you the correct perspective on what to focus on, you go in a better direction. And this was what was happening with me and my wife. We, we, were, we were praying and we and we were like seeing God direct us. And you know what else happened? Through our prayers, we began to have more confidence in the steps that we began to take. Not that we knew everything better, that we just had more confidence because we knew we were drenching everything in prayer. And this is exactly what we see with Jesus, too. You know, when Christ comes to God in the beginning of the story, we see Christ the mess, emotional mess. He's coming before him. He doesn't know what's happening. Well, he knows what's happening, but he's crying before him. He's scared of the cup that's coming. But you know what's crazy? After the moment of saying, God, let your will be done in my life, this scared guy becomes like a boss. He goes out so confidently. Let me read this to you guys in verse 5 and 6, uh, 40, 45 and 46. He says this. And then he came to his disciples and said, sleep, take your rest later on. See, the hour is a hand is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You see how he gets up at that moment and marches towards the people that are about to be about to arrest him. We see this crazy transformation. This is where it all starts. The Garden of Gethsemane in a moment of prayer, asking God to come down, to move within him, for him to actually live out his will. And Jesus marches out. And next week, we're going to learn what happens when he's arrested. Stay tuned. Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for being a God that became human for us. I thank you for being a God that's not distant, that you are a God that actually felt all the pains of life, that you're a God that felt temptation, you're a God that felt suffering, you're a God that felt all the things that we feel, yet, Lord, that you have shown us what it means to live a life of obedience. Dear God, may we first and foremost, O Lord, have faith in you, that, Lord, that your righteousness may become ours. But, Lord, secondly, O Lord, may you teach us what it means to follow after you, to search for your heart, O Lord, to wait for your directions, O Lord, to listen to you. Dear God, I just pray that you may speak to the different families in this room, the individuals in this room, O Lord. May you give them guidance, O Lord, in everything they do, whether it's business ventures, O Lord, or whether it's in their spiritual lives, or whether it's just caring for their children, O Lord, and how to really raise them up, O Lord, in you. May you give us wisdom, O Lord. May you be with the singles in this room, O Lord, that are searching for husbands, O Lord. May you be with them, O Lord, that are searching for what their purpose in life is. Dear God, I pray that we may start with prayer, O Lord, and be sensitive to your voice when it calls. O Lord, and may you guide us and lead us. And may we walk this life, O Lord, the road to the cross. Thank you so much for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Feel free to remain seated.